One important thing to keep in mind when facing the enemy is that they will always show themselves through their contempt. They, depending on which side you're on, at least for me, the enemy shows themselves through their contempt of the people and the Constitution. Although they may act in the name of the Constitution, their contempt will come through in their words. On the other hand, an ally, even if they do not ascribe to the Constitution, will usually show contempt for the corrupt, for arbitrary and tyrannical mandates, and other things like that. And naturally, those that act in the name of the Constitution but are not actually following it will often refer to the Constitution in a way where it provides them with power over us. And instead, this, of course, instead of being a document that guards natural rights for the people against them. So that is the dynamic difference, and that is how you spot an enemy. Do they hold contempt for you as a human being, as an individual, as a natural-born free entity? And do they hold contempt for the Constitution, which they prescribe themselves as officers of it? Now, <clears throat> a perfect example of this can be found in the rather despicable individual known as Stephanie K. Bowman, certainly not an honorable person. Let's go through some of the evidence to decipher the contempt that this person holds for others. In our first example, the court case in the United States District Court, Southern District of Ohio, Ohio v. Uh, ja Love, I'm probably saying that wrong, which was decided on January 12th, 2023, we get a concept of who this person, Stephanie K. Bowman, is. It is State of Ohio plaintiff versus um, Pacheno Jalov L. Defendant with Stephanie K. Bowman, United States Magistrate Judge, and Barrett J. Now, I have no idea what a magistrate judge is because a magistrate is not a judge and a judge is not a magistrate, so those two words don't actually go together. But it's just an arbitrary title. They love to give themselves these official sounding titles. The above caption case was removed to this court by the pro se defendant who has simultaneously moved for leave to proceed in forma pauperis. The undersigned now recommends the sua sponte dismissal and summary remand of this action based upon improper removal and lack of subject matter jurisdiction. Now notice starting out, this writer is, is using Latin words as code and does not explain what those words mean. It's up to the reader to already know it. That's like coded language. That is certainly not due process and whatnot. <clears throat> Anyway, background, on November 16, 2022, a person who identifies himself as Al, oh, that's not his H, uh, Pacieno, possibly that's how you say it, Ja Love LX, Ral uh, Sion Robert Lyle, filed a document that he has been docketed as a notice of removal in this federal court, although the cover sheet for this case identifies it as a civil case removed under federal question jurisdiction, see Doc 1-1. The documents of record make clear that it is nothing of the sort. Instead, it is apparent that defendant is attempting to remove to this case as a new civil case an existing criminal case filed against defendant in the Hamilton County Court of Common Pleas, see Ham Hamilton County Criminal Case Number blah blah blah. According to the publicly available electronic records of the state court, the reference criminal case charges defendant with eight counts trafficking in fentanyl related compounds, trafficking in heroin, aggregated possession of drugs, aggregated trafficking of drugs, possession of fentanyl related compound, carrying concealed weapon, failure to comply with an order of signal of a police officer, and receiving stolen property. 
Now notice in that whole section, that is being listed, that is listing charges as if they were convictions. First notice that. Second, none of these charges are actually constitutional based. So those are two things to note there. And then in continuation, as a basis for removal, defendant's 12-page single-space notice of removal contains numerous nonsensical allegations that closely resemble many similar filings made by sovereign citizens. For example, defendant identifies himself in relevant part as follows. So here you've got an alleged officer, alleged sworn judicial officer of the Constitution, who is treating an individual in mockery, in contempt, in a high degree of unprofessionalism. This person clearly believes themselves a superior to this individual, regardless of whatever crimes they have been charged but not convicted with. This individual does not cite law. She does not know the law. And she thinks that she is a robed noblesse, that she is presider over American citizens, Americans, humanity in general. This person clearly holds contempt for anyone else who's not part of her little friend group and circle, which we'll get to that later on in this video. Anyway, in continuation, uh, she states, comes now, uh, well, this is a quote from what that uh, one guy wrote. Comes now, Pasiano Ja Love El, in propria persona sui juris, not to be confused with pro se, Aboriginal, Indigenous, Moorish American possessing freehold by inheritance status. Sandy squarely affirmed and bound to the Zodiac Constitution with all due respect and honors given to the Constitution for the United States Republic, North America, being a descendant of Moroccans and born in America with the blood of the ancient Moabites from the land of Moab who received permission from the pharaohs of Egypt to settle and inhabit Northwest Africa slash Northgate, the Moors Ark, the founders, and are the two possessors of the present Moroccan Empire with our Canaanite, Hittite, and Amorite brethren who sojourn from the land of Canaan seeking new homes. I don't know what any of that means, but it's not criminal, and it's certainly not a valid reason for this individual to be treated in the way that he's being treated by this magistrate judge whatever that is. Notice of removal goes on to allege that the criminal proceedings against defendant in state court are unconstitutional and unlawful. Well, that would be fair. Based in part upon defendant's belief that the state of Ohio is an unconstitutional private corporation. Doc 1 at 4 page ID. Uh, also see ID. Notifying all parties of the petitioner's Moorish American identification status and that the petitioner was not is not and does not waive any inalienable rights to due process. Let's uh, look at that part for a minute. Does not waive any inalienable rights to due process. I guess that depends on what term inalienable is used, but I do not believe that that is something that you can waive, such as you cannot waive your rights to the Constitution. Those are natural rights the Constitution is supposed to protect. And it's interesting that this individual, Stephanie K. Bowman, does not cite the Constitution despite allegedly swearing an oath to support it. Towards the end of the notice of removal is a demand for monetary damages sought by defendant in this federal court against a long list of governmental entities and individuals loosely associated with the ongoing state criminal court proceedings. In addition to this notice of removal, defendant has filed 28 pages of what have been identified in the docket sheet as state court documents. Whether all of the documents previously have been filed in the related state court criminal record is not entirely clear. What is clear is that the reference documents all reflect the same nonsensical beliefs concerning the alleged illegitimacy of the court system and the state criminal proceedings. They would be illegitimate, but the uh, letter rogatory for relief alleging in part that the Hamilton County Court of Common Pleas is not really a court but rather a military tribunal under admiralty jurisdiction. 
I'm not sure if that's true. I might disagree with it. But either way, none of this stuff is referencing the Constitution as usual. Operate is a private, for-profit corporation listed on Dun & Bradstreet that all cases are civil, though often fraudulently called criminal, and that after finding the alleged defendant guilty, the court clerks sell the judgment to the federal courts and that international bankers have concocted a reverse trust scheme. See also notice of appearance, mandatory judicial notice, motion to dismiss, notice of subrogation, affidavit of title, statement of beneficial ownership, transmit a letter demanding defendant's right to subrogation. And I suppose that's probably enough with this particular case, but if you are so interested, you may read further into it. But the point is that this judge, alleged magistrate judge, levies the charge of sounding like a sovereign citizen, as if that is a constitutional crime, which, of course, she does not cite anything in Constitution because this individual clearly does not respect the Constitution. To her, it's nothing more than toilet paper, which is apparent in the contempt that comes through for other people and charges alone are enough to convict in her opinion obviously none of it's constitutional we find a similar case except this one is not relating to somebody charged with fentanyl or deadly weapon as if that's a, a real charge uh, constitutionally now this court case is over income tax and uh, property tax. Well, it's about anyway, it's about taxes, but it's the uh, same court with um, Bowman and Barrett, both on the previous one, of course. And this is against David M. Lugers at all with the United States of America. Now that's interesting. We have the United States of America that um, treats U.S. citizens like opponents. So take it that way, you will. On June 7th, 2016, the United States filed a civil complaint to collect the unpaid tax liabilities of defendant David M. Lugers for federal income taxes, penalties, and interest, and to enforce the liens of the United States securing that debt against a parcel of real property located in Fairfield, Ohio. In lieu of filing an answer, defendant David Lugers filed a motion to dismiss this lawsuit based upon an alleged lack of jurisdiction. In addition to filing suit against David M. Lugers, plaintiff names his wife, Connie A. Lugers, to the extent that she may have an interest in the property. Ms. Lugers appears to have been properly served, but has filed no timely answer. The United States also named four other defendants to the extent that they may have interest in the same parcel of real property, State of Ohio, City of Fairfield, Butler County and PHH Mortgage Corporation for the same reasons. The complaint alleges that defendant David Lugers owes taxes or related debts to the United States rising out of liabilities beginning with tax year 2002 and continuing through the tax year 2008. As a result, a delegate of the Secretary of the Treasury filed notices of federal tax lien in the Butler County Records Office. <coughs> the complaint further alleges that David M. Lugers owns an undivided one-half interest in the title ownership of property located at blah blah blah. <coughs> the United States seeks to enforce its lien against the Rita May property by having the property sold at a judicial sale and requests a judgment to be entered in favor of the United States against the defendant David M. Lugers in the amount of that, plus statutory additions including interest. Because the defendant David Lugers proceeds pro se, that means for self by the way, the pending motion to dismiss has been referred to the undersigned for initial review. I now recommend the denial of that motion. Analysis. <clears throat> Defendant's motion to dismiss on jurisdictional grounds relies upon what has commonly been described as, quote, sovereign citizen theories. Alleging that defendant is an Ohioan, Ohio national, who is not a citizen of the United States and therefore not subject to its authority. Notice the contempt again. And not to mention, she loves that word, sovereign citizen. That's because she sees all of us as her little slaves. We'll get to that later. Defendant additionally asserts that the Wash 
Office of Employment Comp and Placement, holding that a court has been has personal jurisdiction over a defendant who has received personal. And the rest of this is basically all about the summons and other things like that. But I think we have established a theme with this particular individual who holds nothing but contempt for anybody who should have the misfortune to have her as their presiding magistrate judge. She would, without a doubt and without a second thought, equally treat any veteran, anyone, any single person that is put into those circumstances, she would treat, unless of course they were her friends, she would treat them equally the same. And that's because she despises others because she probably despises herself. But either way, she has contempt for anyone who's not a part of her robed noblesse circle. Now, when we look at the Constitution <clears throat> in Article 6, there's an important part that explains specifically the unconstitutionality, the illegitimacy of this individual and all of her cronies and these illegitimate courts and other people who, in the name of the Constitution, do everything that the Constitution specifically prohibits. And it states, This Constitution, the laws of the United States, shall be made in pursuance thereof, and all treaties made or which shall be made under the authority of the United States shall be the supreme law of the land, not the sovereign citizen charge of Stephanie K. Bowman. That's not a law. And the judges in every state shall be bound thereby. Anything in the Constitution or laws of any state to the contrary, notwithstanding. That means if something contradicts the Constitution, it has no standing. The senators and representatives before mentioned and the members of the several state legislatures and all executive and judicial officers, both the United States and of the several states, shall be bound by oath or affirmation to support this Constitution, but no religious test shall be ever be required as qualification, qualification to any officer of public trust under the United States. And there we go. Now, under the Sixth Amendment, it states that in all criminal prosecutions, the accused shall enjoy the right to a speedy and public trial. That is not a right you can waive because it states that the accused shall enjoy the right to a speedy and public trial. It does not offer the waiving of those rights by an impartial jury of the state and district wherein the crime shall be have committed, shall have been committed. Not a magistrate judge, Stephanie K. Bowman, who believes that the crime of being a sovereign citizen is within her scope of duties as a fraudulent judicial officer of the Constitution. And of course, the impartial jury is the one that will try the crime. Which district shall have been previously ascertained by law and to be formed of the nature and cause of the accusation, to be confronted with the witnesses against him, to have compulsory process for obtaining witnesses in his favor, and to have the assistance of counsel for his defense. Not representation, not advocacy, counsel. In all cases, as far as criminal procedure in the Constitution is concerned, under the Sixth Amendment, everyone has to represent themselves. You cannot have an attorney or somebody else do that for you in a constitutional court. Therefore, the courts that these people set up aren't constitutional. They violate the Constitution constantly. Also in the Fourth Amendment, the right of the people to be secure in their persons, houses, papers, and effects against unreasonable searches and seizures shall not be violated, and no warrants shall issue but upon probable cause. That sentence is used so often to ignore the need for warrants. A warrant is required in all cases of search and seizure, and probable cause does not take the place of warrant. Probable cause is required to get a warrant. And that has to be supported by oath or affirmation, and particularly describing the place to be searched and the persons or things to be seized. 
all of that's ignored naturally by our robed noblesse. Now, I took this portion from the constitution.congress.org or .gov slash forward slash constitution forward slash that is the IRL URL. Either way, it is a government document, allegedly, and official. Now, we should look next at a particular part in the Constitution. From the 13th Amendment on, nearly everything that has been added to the Constitution has been illegitimate. From the 12th and before, that portion of the Constitution is legitimate. And there is a huge distinction between the 13th and the 12th Amendment, those before and after. Those after contain this specific clause, Congress shall have power to enforce this article by appropriate legislation. Now why would you include that in an amendment, alleged amendment to the Constitution, if Congress is doing the amendment and Congress has the legislative ability to do that? Why would you need to include a clause like that? It seems ridiculous. But not only that, the 13th Amendment institutes slavery. See, we are constantly taught, especially in the fraudulent school system of the land-grant mission to make us all into child soldiers and then adult soldiers for their royal military. Well, the Constitution specifically forbids slavery. Naturally, people that like slavery would not like that, and so they institute the 13th Amendment, and then they teach that the 13th Amendment is the thing that removes slavery. The Constitution removes slavery, and the 13th Amendment, 13th Amendment replaced it because it states in the wording, neither slavery nor involuntary servitude except as a punishment for crime. I didn't know there was an exception to slavery and involuntary servitude, but apparently in the 13th Amendment, it is an exception. So you can enslave people as a punishment for a crime. That is what this amendment is stating, and it and all other amendments that come after are fraudulent, they are illegitimate, and they have no standing. Now, the 14th Amendment is equally egregious because it establishes a fraudulent definition of U.S. citizen and also creates the basis for the juridic entities that have been abusing humanity for subsequent centuries. The corporations being listed as having all the rights of, a, of a, the natural rights of a natural born human being is specifically egregious. And of course, you can read the 14th Amendment if you so desire, but it is very long and suffice it to say holds the basis for all kinds of horrible things. Now, in a different part of the Constitution, first of all, in the first part of this section, Section 9, uh, I don't remember which article it was, but if you go to Google, I'll often say that immigration is not directly addressed, but it is actually directly addressed because not only with the uniform naturalization laws or law, uh, the uniform naturalization clause, this portion states the migration or importation, notice the word migration, as in immigration, as in directly addresses immigration in the Constitution. It says the immigration or importation of such persons as any of the states now existing shall think proper to admit shall not be prohibited by Congress to the year 1808 but a tax or duty may be imposed on such importation, not exceeding $10 for each person. Now, this basically is stating that Congress can, after the year 1808, prohibit the importation or the migration or importation of persons to any state. However, that would be a legitimate Congress, of which we have not had one since 1871, at the very least, but specifically since the Civil War because that's when the 12th and 13th amendments were signed and as soon as even if the congress is legitimate but if a congress signs something that is contrary to anything else in the constitution they become illegitimate because they are in fact not fulfilling their oath and of course the writ of habeas corpus shall not be suspended unless and when in cases of rebellion or invasion the public safety may require it 
Notice there's nothing in the Constitution that states that it, the Constitution, can be suspended. The Constitution can never be suspended at any time for any reason. But they do love to make all kinds of excuses for how the Constitution doesn't apply to certain people and it doesn't apply to foreigners, which they're all, they're all lies. They're just liars. Anyway, it also states that no bill of attainder or ex post facto law shall be passed. Ex post facto means after the fact, and boy have we had a lot of ex post facto laws passed. The 14th Amendment is an example of that. The 13th Amendment also an example of that. And they're, they're just simply not legitimate. And then of course the enumeration of the Constitution of certain rights shall not be construed to deny or disparage others retained by the people. And the 9th Amendment. That's definitely ignored. And of course the not honorable Stephanie K. Bowman is a member of the Federal Bar Association. So what exactly is a bar association? There are people that, as far as I can tell, incorrectly state a bar, the bar as relating to the British Accreditation Registry. As far as I can tell, that's not the case. And that's most, mostly a, a method to distract people from the truth, which is in many ways far worse. According to the Wikipedia article, which is certainly trustworthy. That is sarcasm, of course. A bar association is a professional association of lawyers as generally organized in countries following the Anglo-American types of jurisprudence. There is, in fact, no type of jurisprudence. The Anglo-American type of jurisprudence, as they would be referring, would simply be the precedent set by Anglos and Americans. But jurisprudence in itself is simply precedents being set, which they like to not ever define their words in ways that are simple to understand. The word bar is derived from the old English slash European custom of using physical railing to separate the area in which court business is done for the viewing area for the general public. Now, that viewing area for the general public, which they're not going to write in here, is called the galley. The galley is a ship where slaves and prisoners, or prisoner slaves, because those words are uh, synonyms, that's where they were sent in older centuries. And the way they were treated there obviously was not very nice. But it's essentially the same thing. So they put the general public into the galley, and the general public is separated from the, uh, the bench and the bar, via bar, or the barristers. But some bar associations are responsible for the regulation of the legal profession in their jurisdiction. Others are professional organizations dedicated to blah, 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 so on and so forth. Now, further in the, in the Wikipedia article, in the United States, the United States admission to the bar is permission granted by a particular court system to a lawyer to practice law in that system. Well, that's definitely convoluted, but it is very obvious what they're doing here. They seek to establish direct control over anybody who is able to administer justice so that the justice they administer is not constitutional because the Constitution is designed to protect the natural rights of the people, all people, from these people specifically. This is to be distinguished from the membership in a bar association in the United States. Some states require membership in the state bar association for all attorneys, while others do not. Although bar associations historically exist as unincorporated voluntary associations, nearly all bar associations have since been organized or reorganized as corporations. So that actually forms an argument or foundation for the argument that we were, we were recently alluded to by the dishonorable Stephanie K. Bowman, who dislikes, quote, sovereign citizens. But the subject of that first court case said that the government and that the courts are corporations. And at least here we find out that most of the entities that control all of the people that operate within those courts, well, they are subject to corporations. For their licensing and everything else. Furthermore, membership is in some of them, see the next section below, is no longer voluntary, 
which is why some of them have omitted the word association and merely call themselves the state bar to indicate that they are the incorporated incorporated body that constitutes the entire admitted legal profession of a state. We are ruled over by corporations and that confirms it very clearly. So let's look into this a little bit further. When we go to the British Virgin Islands Bar Association website, we get a direct determination of what these the importance of these things are. And you'll of course find them in nearly every part of the world. The globalist dream that they've established. The British Virgin Islands Bar Association, BVIBA, was founded in 1976 and is a voluntary association of lawyers. It is the voice of the legal profession in the Virgin Islands. The BVIBA has its own constitution, ethical standards to uphold, and disciplinary procedures. So what that tells you immediately is that this BVIBA seeks to make itself the, as, as the wielder of law. So whatever law in the Virgin Islands, none of it makes any difference because practically speaking, those that are members of the BIVBA will have to follow its constitution, ethical standards, and be afraid of its disciplinary procedures, not in fact the law that they are supposed to be upholding. It is a leash to put on the people within it. And of course, this, this subject of the bar gets a little bit difficult when you have so many different entities that are called it, such as with the British Association of Reinforcement, which is actually a partially humorous name because it relates to like rebar and construction. But uh, this is a probably a corrupt entity that seeks to regulate construction so that people are, are only allowed access to certain construction materials. Now, if we go to the bar in England, we can look a little bit further into this. They often quote, they quote, often acting on behalf of the most vulnerable members of society. And they are independent advocates. Well, that's not true. They are definitely dependent advocates. They're dependent upon their groups and all their customs and all of their other things that keep them on a leash, but that is not, of course, for the benefit of the most vulnerable members of society, only on behalf of the most vulnerable members of society, but for the benefit of the corrupt, basically. And barristers enable people to uphold their legal rights. Barristers enable people to uphold their legal rights. People can't uphold themselves to their legal rights. Apparently, U.S. military members that swear to uphold and defend the Constitution can't. Only barristers can. And there you get that word bar. Bar is short for barrister. And if we look into this further, we find special organizations, but we also find the Inns of Court. What is an Inn of Court? Let's look into that one. In England, or in London, you have four. You have the Gray's Inn, Inner Temple, Lincoln's Inn, and the Middle Temple. Now, I specifically seek to look at this Lincoln's Inn because that relates to a particularly atrocious individual in the American history, Abraham Lincoln, who was himself allegedly a member of these organizations. And this is the Honorable Society of Lincoln's Inn, and their very fitting shield has a bunch of what I can, what looks like to me, chains, multiple disconnected chains. According to the website, quote, Lincoln's Inn is a thriving society of barristers situated in a large estate of historic buildings, contemporary facilities, and tranquil grounds in central London. The Inn is a multifaceted organization, but is primarily dedicated to the qualification, training, and development of our members at all stages of their legal careers in a prestigious, collegiate, and inclusive environment. Now, do we have these in America? Yes, we do. American Inns of Court at inns.com endsofcourt.org. The J. Edgar Murdoch 
Inns of Court is a professional association of attorneys devoted to supporting excellence, civility, professionalism, and ethics in the practice. The members of the Murdoch Inn meet for dinner in a presentation once per month from September through April. There's your secret society meetings where they all get together and decide how they are going to practice law against us. And those, of course, are your alleged sworn officers of the Constitution. And naturally, their membership composition is our masters, barristers, and associates. Hence, bar. Barrister bar. And most of the people for this, obviously, are particularly corrupt individuals. But then, going back to Ohio, of which a region that I'm from, personally. The William K. Thomas American Inn of Court we find in, in Cincinnati, uh, Cleveland. Yes, we find it in Cleveland, which is a city to the north. But nearly every major city in the United States has a Inn of Court, and I'm sure you'll find them in Mexico and Canada and pretty much every place around the globe will have Inns of Court so that all of the different individuals that are allegedly the practitioners of law can all get together and decide what their law is going to be and to basically ignore the laws of the legitimate laws of the land. The dishonorable Mary Jane Trapp, uh, Ohio Court of Appeals 11th Appellate District, is the president. And then Brandon Mordu Esquire. Now notice with all of these titles, when you put Esquire after your name, that is the same as saying sir. It's title of nobility. The Constitution specifically prohibits titles of nobility. And most of these people have titles of nobility. But there's a lot of interesting names that pop up and a lot of interesting positions, such as Abigail Greiner, Esquire, Social Security Administration, kind of like a certain Greiner that was allegedly released from Russia for a arms dealer instead of a U.S. Marine veteran. Awatef Assad, Esquire, Community Outreach Chair. We find a, uh, another interesting name in Awatef Assad, Esquire, Cuyahoga County Department of Law. wonder if that's a relation to a particular Assad in a certain Middle Eastern country. And this William K. Thomas American Inn of Court also has a Facebook profile. How nice. Now, going back to the counterparts in Britain, who aren't really counterparts, but more of the level that is above these American Inns of Court, considering that the British Inns of Court were the original and then the Americans followed them, as these people even allow in all of their descriptions for foundation and whatnot. Well, when we go back to their overlords in Britain, we find a list that states USA lawyers. List of not of English-speaking lawyers and translators slash interpreters for British nationals in the USA. Well, we speak English in the USA, so why would you need a translator to translate things into English? Kind of odd. But it gets even more interesting when we go to the J-1 visa. Form seeking a waiver for the two-year home residence requirement. And it states, under non-objection statement, J-1 visa, that, quote, the United States authorities are accordingly unable to consider my application unless the United Kingdom government are, clear that should be is, but prepared to furnish the United States Secretary of State with the statement in writing that they have no objection to the grant of a waiver of the two-year home residence requirement specified in Section 212 of the United States Immigration and Nationality Act. So what that is telling you is that the allegedly sovereign U.S. government has to wait for approval from their overlords in Britain. Now, isn't that interesting? That tells you exactly what the visa system is designed for. Slavery. That's what it's designed for. And then there's also the Bar Association, which is for accreditation 
and certification assurance on credibility of certified organizations. And this is another interesting organization that would be worth looking into, but they relate to ISO. ISO is a very interesting organization and suspicious support. And it is a organ international organization for standardization located in Geneva, Switzerland. Lots of interesting entities located in Geneva or in Switzerland, specifically. Like Davos, for instance. Anyway, according to their website, ISO is an independent, non-governmental international organization with a membership of 167 national standards bodies. Through its members, it brings together experts to share knowledge and develop voluntary census-based market-relevant international blah blah blah. The usual. And then, of course, they have a central secretariat. Anyway, the ISO was formed in London in 1946. That date certainly coincides with many, and I suspect there are many uh, Belgian Workers' Party or otherwise known as Nazis around them, among them, or other Workers' Party individuals from that time period. Now, this brings into the question about feasibility and practicability. Now, let's say we, we know these people are enemies. Well, what are they going to do? They are going to use threat of force. They are going to send their agents. So, if an agent of Seth Stephanie K. Bowman, or trio or duo of agents, or of any of these other fraudulent entities acting in the name of the Constitution but violating it, if any of them show up, you do not meet them alone. Or perhaps you don't meet them alone. That is entirely up to you and your prerogative. I would not deem to dictate to others as these people do. Instead, I would just say something that you can do is that you can meet these agents with superior force. You do not, you do not have to meet them with inferior force. You don't have to be alone. You can meet them with superior force. You get your neighbors together, armed, you surround them. And as soon as they attempt to engage some sort of unconstitutional or unlawful act, you there on the spot deliver them to the nearest military base. And then at the military base, the members are charged to uphold their oaths to uphold and defend the Constitution. And that this person is charged with such and such and must be held at the base under guard until they can be properly administered, justice can be administered upon them. And this is, of course, myself speaking from the perspective of someone who swore that oath. I know personally that the oath of enlistment does not have a time period on it. It does not expire. All people that swore an oath to uphold and defend the Constitution, if they do not do so, can be found in dereliction of duty. And all of these people acting under the color of law and pretending to be sworn officers aren't. And none of them are supporting the Constitution. They are supporting themselves, their little clubs and groups, their little inns of court, and their little pretend robed noblesse, and that they are our sovereigns. Now, there is a precedent for this activity that I told, that I um, mentioned, which is the delivering up of criminals, or charged criminals, alleged, to military bases. This is a standard practice that was done at the time that the Constitution was made. And this we can found, find in J. Long's journal, which is marked dated 1768 to 1782. There's a particular passage where an Indian is uh, charged with a murder. Now, on page 78, it states, an Indian boy, about 15 years of age, was standing at some distance from the fort when a savage fired his gun and accidentally killed an Englishman. As he was advancing, he discovered the boy leaning against a tree, and not being of the same nation, he formed a resolution to take him prisoner, having no suspicion of the boy's intention. He went up to him and took him by the arm. The boy very artfully drew back and shot the Indian, at some distance from the fort. When a savage fired his gun and accidentally killed... Oh wait, I already read that. Um, 
shot the Indian through the chin. This also incensed him that he was raising his hand to tomahawk him. When another Indian instantly came coming up, asked his companion who had wounded him. He replied the boy, adding that he would immediately take his scalp. The other prevented his bloody purpose and told him he would protect the lad for he was too brave to die. He carried him to the fort where he was purchased by the commanding officer to prevent the Indian whom he had wounded from killing. And there you get a precedent demonstrated around the time that the Constitution was ratified of somebody charged with a crime being taken to the nearest military base. That is a perfectly legitimate procedure that all people who are defended and protected under the Constitution can do because every single individual that entered the armed forces swore an oath to do that. Exactly. And then in the Fifth Amendment, it states, No person shall be held to answer for a capital or otherwise infamous crime unless on a presentment or indictment of a grand jury, except in cases arising in the land or naval forces or in the militia when in actual service in time of war or public danger. I would certainly state that this is public danger and it has been alluded to as such by orders, not alluded to, but declared as such by orders from President Trump, executive orders and whatnot, declaration of a national emergency and things like that. That's public danger and that's time of war. That means that a grand jury presentment or indictment of grand jury is not required. You can hold somebody to answer for capital or otherwise infamous crime without a grand jury because cases if a case arriving in land or naval forces or in the militia when in actual service in time of war or public danger. That's simple as that. But there's still always due process to be followed. And due process can be found in custom, tradition, practice, and precedent. That's the point of those things. But none of those things can be contrary to the Constitution, which they often are. Thank you. If you have enjoyed this video, please like this video, share it, subscribe to my channel, and check out my other content that's available, especially the written kind. I do publish books. And as always, stay tuned. There will be more.